now. And I will just let everyone in. So while everyone is connecting to their audio, um, I will just run through a few housekeeping rules for everyone. First of all, a welcome return to you all for our um, webinar series. We had a summer break, which was quite nice, but we're back. Um, we're back at it and we're back to tell you all about the National Harvest Mouse Survey. Sorry, I had a cat that's joined me. So um, please ignore that in the background. If you are having any problems um, tonight with your audio, then please exit the Zoom and click back onto the link and I will let you in as soon as I can. And that should hopefully sort out the problems. Um, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please could you pop them in the chat box, which uh, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, selecting to everyone so we can read them out at the Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, and more housekeeping notes is you are all on mute for the moment, just so that the feedback um, doesn't interfere with Derek and Fraser's talk. And the best way to view our webinar, because we will be sharing presentation, is to select the view of the speaker and then go from there. But without further ado, I would like to introduce you all to Derek Crawley, our lovely vice chair of the Mammal Society, and Dr. Fraser Coomba, our science officer. And as I mentioned earlier, they are here to tell us all about the National Harvest Mile Survey and the first season's results. So without further ado, Derek, would you like to take it away? Uh, thank you very much and uh, good evening, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen so that you can see what we're going to be talking about. And... And if I can, so Fraser, can you see that as that first slide? Yep. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, yes, it's the harvest mouse. The harvest mouse is one of our smallest rodents. Um, it is comparable size wise to a pygmy shrew, uh, not a rodent, but again, very small animal. It weighs about um, six to eight grams. That's about a two pence piece. And it's uh, unique in the fact that it has a prehensile tail. And this prehensile tail allows it to actually grip the um, vegetation so that it can actually move between stalks by actually having an anchor and then leaning forward with its two front feet actually then jump across quite uh, small gaps or large gaps as it goes. It also uses it as a brake as it actually travels down through the stems um, if it needs to drop down because of predators from above. Those predators tend to be birds of prey. Um, it has, as you can see, quite large eyes and uh, prominent ears. That allows it to um, um, navigate and also listen out for predators. The eyes uh, are important because they tend to be um, both come out at dusk and also a dawn area, but during the winter they're completely nocturnal and they need those large eyes to actually gather in enough light to be able to navigate through the stems. If there's a little uh, video here for you that shows you just how agile they are. And you can't always see how that tail works, but it is sometimes used just as a balance, which is why they're swinging it around that little bit. But because of this, uh, that their ability, they can go onto very small stems as well as run quite happily up and down bits of bramble um, as well. As you can see, these ones are actually in captivity. It's very hard to actually record these things or see these things in the wild. I've been looking for harvest mice and, and mammals in general for uh, well over 40 years. Um, and I've never seen, I've seen one um, harvest mouse run away in front of me through vegetation when I was doing a survey. But other than that, uh, I've only ever seen them from live capture traps. So if we go back to these features, you can see they can nicely balance. The important thing here is that um, their feet their um, thumbs are, are slightly bigger and they are also almost um, opposable. So that gives them a better grip 
on with their front feet to actually hold seeds and things in place, but also to hang on to vegetation. And again, their toes at the back allows them to actually grip that vegetation and therefore move out. Now, it needs to be said that nice pictures though this is, you're not going to really see them sitting on willow. Um, and what you tend to find on a lot of these pictures is people cheat. Uh, and that's what's on this occasion has happened. So I've just put a bit of willow up, got a captive mouse, put it on there, gave a nice blank background so I can get a good picture of the actual uh, mouse itself to show its features, but it's not real. And you'll see this in some of the other pictures as they come along. When you look at the diet, um, these animals don't hibernate. They, they have to be active all the way through the winter. And therefore, they need to be able to eat roughly about a third of their body weight a day. Most of that comes down in seeds, and they can have these throughout the winter. But also, uh, there's, um, you can see there's a little bit of leaf in there, and there's quite a lot of insects as well at the appropriate time. Now, it has to be remembered that although the seeds have got higher energy, they haven't got much water content whereas the insects become quite important for some of the fruit and berries later on because they have a higher water content as well. For the rest of the time, it tends to come down to getting their water from um, dew on the leaves themselves so they can lick that directly off. They don't need to come out of that stalk area in order to, to find water. If we look at where they are, and we'll talk a little bit about um, more about this later on. This is a page from the um, latest National Atlas. It shows you um, in the little red triangles where there were records only found in 1960 to 92. In the um, green little um, circles, which are hard to see on this map, but they're where they were found both in that period as well as the current period which is 2000 to 2016 and the green triangles are only records from 2000 to 2016. More importantly if you look to see where most of these records come from although there are records throughout the year the majority of the records are coming in this winter period. You can see that you get a huge spiking activity in October and November uh, but it's still quite high going through to sort of January, February, and then it dips down in the summer when um, it's much harder um, to record them. Where do these records come from? Well, all those huge spikes in October and November are basically nest searches. So actually Maryland managed to go out and find a now defunct breeding nest. It's about the size of a tennis ball. Um, and it's been used to actually raise young, and there's a new one produced for every litter that the harvest mice produce. So by finding these, it's very easy to then record them. Unfortunately, it's not the easiest thing in the world to find because they're made up of living grass stems, and as the grass dies off, they become brown, and the surrounding grass is brown, and a active nest is basically green in green stems and is very hard to find. Occasionally you will find um, owl pellets and owl pellets contain a variety of different small mammals that the owls have been eating and if you gently dissect them you can pull out the skulls. Because harvest mice are so small the skull is quite um, delicate and quite often you find that it actually um, crushes the actual upper skull where the, uh, the cranium is, and therefore it'd be quite difficult. But one of the key things about this is that the, uh, the molars in the upper jaw have five root canals, um, and at that size, then it's, it, it makes a very characteristic um, and easily identifiable feature that you can say, yes, that's actually a harvest mouse. So that's quite a good method to use, but you've got to go through an awful lot of our pellets to find that one particular harvest mouse that's there, because they're not high up on the list that the owls actually um, eat. You could find dead animals, um, and these dead animals tend to be brought in by cats or a cat, cat kills. Um, most other animals will actually eat them. There's no um, worries within that, but 
Um, cats will bring them back and quite often if they bring you back uh, a present it's very important that you record what they've actually caught but it needs to be said within that that basis that most cats um, if they specialize in mammals they tend to bring back more males than females because of the characteristics of the males being more adventurous and therefore they're not having a direct uh, impact necessarily on their populations and just occasionally people will catch them in Longworth traps. Now the Longworth traps are a live capture trap for those that don't know, and you have to set the, the treadle quite lightly. And quite often when you do catch one, you don't think you've caught anything at all because the mouse is so light in the first place. So it's always a pleasant surprise when you catch one. There's always a lots of excitement um, to, uh, within that one. And quite often it's the first time that you actually know you have harvest mice in an area. Uh, unless you've actually done nest searches. Over the years, there have been many, many um, attempts to try and find harvest mice, to try and make it slightly easier, less effort, if you like, than looking at nest searches. And many years ago, um, the Mammal Society trialled these um, tennis balls with holes in them. And the idea was that the harvest mice would actually go in there, potentially nest in there, but at least they'd go in and the droppings would, would in, give us an indication that there were harvest mice present. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, we've since found out that harvest mice don't like using nest boxes. They won't use those within them uh, as, it, as such. And we actually found an awful lot of evidence of both wood mice, uh, bank voles, even field voles and, sh and shrews actually being at that height in the vegetation and leaving their droppings inside these uh, contraptions. Uh, we also found that a lot, a lot of cows ate them just to be peculiar um, within that. So we've tried um, live traps. So this is a, a Longworth on your um, um, right hand side and on the left there's a tube trap. Both of them have caught. We've tried putting them high up in vegetation. You can see one there actually sitting on a little platform. And again, uh, we were very excited. We think we're only ever going to catch harvest mice in these. But in fact, on this trial that uh, we did in Staffordshire, uh, we managed to catch every small mammal species apart from um, harvest mice. We caught those at ground level rather than actually in the, in the canopy of the grasses. So that was a bit of a surprise and most of our captures tend to be lower down. Um, but it does show that they haven't got that area exclusively for them. There are other animals that exploit that but don't live at that height. Uh, they just visit. Um, this was a, a nice idea. So this is using an excluder. This excluder is set at about 11 millimetres and that only allows harvest mice and pygmy shrews to actually go through. So again, with the cup inside, if you feed that up with grain, then if you get droppings inside, um, it's basically harvest mice. So that's a quite good method that's quite not as intrusive in trying to find these um, elusive mice. You can also use that, uh, that mesh inside Longworths so that the only animal that you're going to catch is going to be harvest mice. And that's proved quite useful uh, in various studies. Rather than getting your um, first animal in, you're actually then just waiting for the harvest mice to come in and you have a greater opportunity of catching them. Um, other methods that have been tried because of the difficulty is to actually train your dog to become um, a sniffer dog to sniff out harvest mouse poo. And this was actually done by Emily Howard Williams for a PhD at uh, Northampton University. And she found it quite successful. You can train your dog up and it can be more efficient than sending people out to actually do nest searches. So all depending on how good your dog is, how good your training is, it might be the way to do it. And on a general walk, hopefully the dog can just pull out the, those, uh, those poo smells and give you an indication that harvest mouse is present. And we still need to know an awful lot more about harvest mice and distribution, which is why we're doing the national survey. So how do you go about finding harvest mice? 
you've got to be in the right location. You've got to think like a harvest mouse. And they like tall vegetation that they can climb in between. This short grassland here, this short um, 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 wildflower meadow is exactly that. It's too short. And if you, you're not going to find a harvest mouse in this location, but you will find um, the runs of field voles and things like that in it. So you've got to pick your area and the right type of vegetation to actually move forward. Here we're doing slightly better. We've now got some tussock grasses in the foreground. And as you look through the, the, uh, the, the close stems, that's where you're going to find the nest. But if you go all the way to further back and again, looking at the right, you've got a lady looking at shorter grass and she's still looking for field voles, whereas the gentleman further up are actually looking for harvest mice. So it's picking the right vegetation and knowing where to look to try and get that, that, that image going. You'll even find that some of the grasses that actually grow tall through things like bramble can be very useful. And again, as you drive around the place, you could just stop and, and, and have a quick look. And that's how quite a lot of my records come into it, is that as I drive around the country, I see a, a, a short section, I think, oh, that could be quite good. And therefore I have a quick rummage through the grasses, remembering to put my gloves on so I don't get my hands caught on the brambles. And quite often you'll find a harvest mouse nest. Uh, there is one somewhere in this picture, but we'll come back to that. Again, ditches with overgrown vegetation is another good place. Nothing's going to be on the um, on the short grassland here, but on the uh, along this ditch edge with the taller grasses, these look like they're a, a, a reed canary grass. That's going to be much more the habitat that you'd expect. And because of the bramble and the trees, some of those branches, some of those stems are going to be um, kept upright and that's going to be make it much easier to actually do your nest searches within them. The earlier in the season that you look, the better you're going to be because as, the, as we progress, then a lot of this vegetation actually falls down. And although you can still find it um, in that fallen vegetation, we tend to find more nests in the standing than anything else. And as you can see here, there's quite a few people looking and we find it's um, a good community event because there's a little bit of a challenge here of who's going to find the first one, who's going to find most of them. And I have to say that uh, the volunteers that come out uh, with the Staffordshire Mammal Group um, don't like me joining in too much because they swear blind that I keep them in my pocket because they walk through and can't find them. And I come up behind them and say, look, you missed this one and this one. And it is all about getting your eye in um, and going out with somebody who can find them in the first place so you can start to get that idea of where they're going to be. So it basically is any vegetation that is close together and has got a little bit of height on it. So this is in a, um, a, a wetland area with close sedges and there's quite a few harvest mice um, that actually live through this. The only worries that you've got is that the um, sedges have got very sharp edges and you cut your hands if you haven't got your gloves. So it's just a word of warning as far as that goes. But you can look in odd places. So you've got set aside areas, you've got even elephant grass. Um, these are all areas that should be looked at um, because the stems are in the right format. So here's one of those fun pictures again, and this is the important one. The, you've got to consider this animal has to move between those stems. If those stems are slightly further apart, then it can't move between, and if it can't reach across from one stem to another, it can't build its nest. So sometimes when you look at that vegetation, if it's too far apart, then um, you're not going to find your nest, you're not going to find the harvest mice. So it's just trying to work out what that is, and I'm afraid that comes with experience more than anything else. So within this reed bed, you can see that um, there's not a lot of leaf at this stage, but there is quite a lot of air or gaps in between those main stems. So that would be quite a challenge for a harvest mice to actually get in there and pull the leaves together 
in order to make that nest. So here's a nest. Now these are important things. You can see that it's still quite green. It tends to blend in very well. But what you will see is the actual leaves have been shredded. And this shredding is very important. You quite often find little grass um, shreds in the, in the general area where they thought about having a nest but haven't actually built it. And by shredding the, these particular leaves, they can then weave those together to make a ball. And the ball is connected to the grass stems. So if you find a nice, neat ball that you can actually pluck out of the vegetation without bringing any stems with it, then it might well not be a harvest mouse nest. You've got to look for these split stems um, in, in your searches. So you can see here's one that hasn't quite been started, where well, it's been started, but hasn't progressed to anywhere. And then about a foot away, we found another nest um, to this, but you can see there's those shreddings on those leaves. So what a harvest mouse does is basically, um, as it comes, the, the female, as she goes through a pregnancy, about, um, about a week before she's due to give birth, she will pick a site to make a breeding nest. She will um, grab hold of a single stem with her tail, with her two front, with her two back feet, and then she will reach across and bring a leaf towards her that she can then run her teeth through and actually split those stems. And then she can actually tie those together round the main stems, as you can see in step five, and then uh, gradually build up this nest into a dome with no Pacific entrance. She burrows her way in and out every time she wants to go. Okay, but it ends up being about six to 10 centimeters in diameter. And in there, she will give birth um, to um, anything up to um, eight young. It's normally between sort of four and five, but eight has, isn't unheard of. And she basically will have about three to seven litters a year depending on um, conditions. So here's the actual gestation, um, as you can see. So it's basically, um, 17 to 19 days. Um, she'll go up to a, a, a quite a, a large weight, about 15 um, grams. Um, once the young have been born, then basically um, they're on um, milk for about two weeks, um, but they disperse very quickly um, soon after that two weeks, about two and a half weeks, and then they become independent. Uh, and basically, if they're about 40 days old, then they themselves can breed. So therefore, there's get quite a large number of, of harvest mice as you move through the summer. And therefore, again, looking for nests in the early autumn, there's a lot of nests that are there both for uh, breeding and also as, uh, as independent ones for, for keeping warm. Unfortunately, if you've got eight young harvest mice sitting in a nest, then the nest can quite easily get destroyed. So you might not find that ball, but if you're still finding those shredded grasses, it still gives that indication. So not all of the nests are going to survive simply because if you've got lots of children, they ruin the house. You can find nests at any time of the year, but most of the time it's looking at the, um, in the autumn and, uh, and, um, and January, February, early, early, early winter. Um, but you're looking at either the tall vegetation or tussock grasses. And therefore you should be able to pull out uh, this loose ball, uh, again, with those shredded uh, items, leaves within them. Where the nest is, is quite important. That's one of the things that we ask for within the survey is at what height 
we tend to find them and it tends to be um, towards for the tall grasses about sort of three quarters of the way up. So here is uh, a reed bed, the reed bed with Phragmites is just falling over. We've separated the stems and hey presto, right in the middle of the picture, there's your harvest mouse nest. So this was down at Radipole Lake. Um, it was on a training day. They hadn't recorded harvest mice at that lake before. We found the first nest in the first five minutes and then found loads afterwards. Once you get your eye in, it works quite effectively. In other areas, um, this is in a, um, again, a sedge, but you can see they don't always use the material um, that's there. This is actually some of the grasses that grow through that sedge to start off with, and they've actually incorporated that around some of these stems. But it's still that tight ball with those um, um, shredded leaves within it that we're looking for. And again, size-wise, you can see the person's hand there is quite useful. And again, um, again, looking at the reed canary grasses, uh, again, they're just separating those grasses. It's almost like you're going to use your hands like a comb and you move through those different layers until this tennis ball size actually jumps out at you. And it can be quite difficult. So this picture is um, about a third of the way up the page. But we also find them in tussock grasses. Uh, and this is uh, Col Cotsfoot. Uh, and here, as you part the grasses, you tend to find the nest just at the top of the, or uh, the base of the rosette of, of those leaf, of those branch, of those uh, grasses that come out. You don't find them in the taller seed heads uh, with there. And again, you can see just how tight that, that actual ball is. And it's still about the size of a tennis ball. If you look at uh, an individual nest, then it's about the size of a golf ball. And they make these in winter um, across the vegetation, but actually at ground level. Um, and they are uh, extremely small. Sometimes you will find them in the upper layers, but quite often these are found very, no very near the ground um, for either winter, but, uh, and it goes from that. They're a lot harder to find. And you can see there's in size comparison with a 50 pence piece, just to sort of show that idea. Occasionally, you might just be lucky and be able to spot the nest by looking at the vegetation. Uh, and this one, I'm afraid, is a very poor quality picture. But again, you should see in the middle, about a third of the way up, a darker patch. And that's just the nest. Uh, on this particular occasion, we'd just finished doing a survey. We found about 30 or 40 nests. And as we were coming out of the fields, this was just sticking us in the eye um, just before we finished in an area that we wouldn't normally look on because there was very, very sparse vegetation. But if the populations are quite high, they will use suboptimum habitats. And again, can you spot the nest in this picture? Um, so this is, is quite difficult, but again, just from a path as you're walking along, hey presto, you can see it. And this one's about a third from the top, again central, and you can just see the tighter woven ball. I can see Sophie's looking a little bit harder. If I move my, if I put the mouse up there, does that help? And it is just this case of trying to get your eye in to what that vegetation looks like. If you consider that to be surrounded by other stems, you really have to part all those stems to try and find it. And it's very easy to miss it, um, which is why um, you need to be careful. But once you get the bug of trying to find these things, then you look in all the places that might be. So this is actually on a lowland heath. This is a bit of black grass. And again, there we've we pulled out a nest um, out of that. Um, without too much um, searching to go with it. And we didn't find one nest, we found several in this area, just to show that again, they're actually uh, utilizing habitats that we don't really think that they might be in. And one of the things that we don't really know at the moment is how high up out in altitude harvest mice are going. So if you are going to walk up a hill at some point, uh, please look out for harvest mice at the top. 
And it's been nice to see if we can, can't find which is the highest record this year. And that's just a close up of that particular nest. And you can see how it's woven together and the splits on it once again. So going back to this picture, again, you can see the, um, the nest across close up just in here. This would have been um, a lot more denser vegetation, but someone put a mower through it, but just happened to, to leave that one nest behind. So it is a case of trying to get in there before some of this vegetation goes. And again, one of the things that we'll be looking for is to see what management um, needs to happen. So again, for surveys, if we record what type of management's happening in the area, that's going to be useful. Per, I personally find that wetland sites are more productive for Staffordshire than um, the grassland sites or the edge of fields or the edge of hedgerows. Um, and, and again, you have to have a, a bit more of a, a deep search, but again, you can pull out these nests quite easily in these wetland habitats. And this is going back to the, um, the rushes. And again, within those rushes, they do split some of those leaves, but they do use some of the other vegetation around to actually make the nests within that. And although this is all collapsed over, it's still quite effective within that. So this is the important thing. A harvest mouse nest is connected to the vegetation. I couldn't pull this nest out without actually bringing those leaves with me. If I actually held that upside down, it would still be attached, it wouldn't fall on the floor. If you think about other animals that use this uh, uh, location, so things like reed buntings, sedge warblers, willow, um, um, sedge warblers, reed, reed warblers, then those nests don't tend to be attached and they fall out the vegetation very early on in the, in the late autumn, early winter, whereas the harvest mouse uh, nests survive that bit longer. However, there are some um, things that can confuse you. So this one found in, in amongst um, a hedge at the top of the hedge, you can see some of that splitting of grass stems. You can see some of that binding together, but this is a, this is a dormouse nest. It's a little bit bigger and it's not attached to the vegetation. This just sits in the cleft of that particular area. It comes away clean it's not attached and that tends to be the main difference. And because dormice haven't read the books, they sometimes will go and have nests in grassland areas. So we found them in before now in reed beds and things like that. So there is some crossover between the two species. And that's when we really need to have a, a much closer look to see what it's attached to, to try and make that decision on where it is. This is another dormouse nest. And this one's inside a, uh, a tube. Uh, the tube is about um, two inches, which is oh, about uh, 50 mil across. Uh, we don't find that harvest mice don't use boxes or anything else. They only go into vegetation and attach it to the vegetation. So this is definitely pushing itself down to be a, um, a dormouse nest. It's not a wood mouse nest because they produce, they don't, create these uh, woven balls. They just basically uh, stick as much vegetation as in and there are possible and turn around a few times inside it. So although you've got a very good neat ball here, again, um, this is more dormouse again, it's standalone, it's not attached to that vegetation. And it's trying to make those decisions on what you're actually going to find and how it's actually there. So this one is a loose nest in amongst um, things. It's quite large. Uh, you can see there on the, uh, the tape measure, it's ending up about, it's about 150 um, mil, 15 centimeters, generally too big for um, harvest mice. It doesn't have um, an awful lot of split stems on it. And it's probably, 
um, unless the vavol, and because of the size of it, it's probably a water vol within a, a, a reed bed area next to a river or pond. Um, this one is a field vole nest. It's just made up of very, very short cut bits of vegetation that are basically piled together. So it looks like it's in a ball, but if you pick it up and jiggle it in your hand, it basically falls apart. Um, and that's another indication. You tend to find that the harvest mouse nest will stay as a ball uh, within it, as the dormice do as well. We do still find peculiar ones. So this is quite a large um, nest within this. Um, the one on your right is actually um, in uh, elephant grass. Um, and, and that did turn out to be harvest mice because we saw an animal come out from it. Um, so they do use some very peculiar areas. And again, you've got another example just on the other side. Um, in some uh, some carex again, some 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 rushes, but occasionally we get oddities. So this was a a nest that was sent to me just as a photograph. You can see that it's got split stems on it, um, but when you look at the actual size of it, it's far too big for most harvest mouse nests. But unfortunately, this is all we were sent, so we still can't make our mind up whether or not this is a dormouse which hasn't been recorded in the area, or whether this is harvest mouse, which have been recorded in the area. So we can't always, just from a photograph, have an absolute, we know what it is. But we do ask you to take as many photographs of your nest as possible, because it will allow most of our experts to say, give you a positive, yes, that is um, a harvest mouse. As I say, this is just to show you how to cheat and get close-ups of, uh, of harvest mouse photographs. Most of the photographs you see um, aren't in the wild. They are merely uh, a captive animal standing inside a, uh, a washing up bowl um, with a bit of vegetation there, surrounded by people with big cameras that can manage to miss out each other from being seen. So my quest for you at this point is, uh, Come and find you. Come and find me. See if you can't find a harvest mouse in your location. So, Fraser. Thank you, Derek. Um, so, firstly, just I must apologise. I'm just recovering from a bit of a cold. So, if I cough and splutter, uh, my voice starts cracking up. Uh, that's why. But... I will start off by just giving you a historical perspective on recording of harvest mice. So Stephen Harris back in the 1970s and 1990s organized several harv national harvest mouse surveys. And this generated a lot of records, presence records and collated the presence of harvest mice into hectares or 10 by 10 kilometer grid squares. And this is the map you can see on your left. Uh, the last survey was one that the Mammal Society did in 2014, which is the map on your right. Now, next slide, please, Derek. Now, through all these surveys and through biological recording or the recording of a species at a particular place during a particular date, have given, as Derek has said, us a really good idea of where harvest mice are, generally where their distribution in the UK is. So you can see here on the left, this green hull or green shape file is the produced during the population uh, review of mammals in the UK back in 2018. And this just creates a hull around all the available records from 1995 through to 2016. The one in the middle uh, was from the Atlas of British Mammals, which Derek talked about a bit earlier and was from, we can see the collation of records into two distinct periods. And on the right here is all the records of harvest mice. So generally the main thing to come out of this is that as you can see, their distribution is kind of a south 
easterly from sort of Nottingham, no Nottingham, Northumbria through to sort of like the, the Severn and sort of southeast of that. But these, what gets me is, is the blank spaces on these maps. Um, because these predominantly come from biological records or presence only records, we, we can't be certain whether these blank white areas on the map are because harvest mice aren't there or if no one has gone there. As Derek says, we're not sure how high they actually go. At the moment, our highest record, if I remember correctly, is around 350 metres. But is that because people are looking in low level areas and that no one's looking at the top of mountains for harvest mice? And this is something that I, we looked at during the latest survey, but I'll come on to that shortly. If we can move to the next slide. So you saw from the last middle map, most sort of temporal trends using these presence only records look at collating them into large temporal periods. And there was a piece of work that we at the Mammal Society looked into looking at the temporal trends of many British mammals, but as we're talking about harvest mice here, we'll present the graph here, and we're looking at occupancy. So this is the number of monads, or one by one kilometre British national grid squares, uh, that were occupied, but, or the proportion that were occupied across the UK in several years from 1970 to 90, uh, 2016. And we can see that there has been quite a decline. And this is one of the finer scale temporal trends we've been looking at. Uh, next slide, please, Derek. So this is a lovely infographic put together by our very own Sophie. Um, this highlights really well kind of what we know about harvest mice. So as I said earlier, Back in the 1970s and the 1990s, with sort of like the first sort of surveys of harvest mice across the UK at a national level. And we can see, like, between the 1970s and 1990, there is evidence of it already, evidence of a decline in harvest mice, where only 29% of the original 300 sites were found to be um, occupied again. Uh, back in 1995, Stephen Harris produced the first population review, and for harvest mice, the estimate of the number of animals in the UK was just under one and a half million, so one million four hundred twenty-five thousand. And in a simplistic sort of term, the work myself and Derek did on the Atlas of British Mammals we could actually see that there were 139 fewer hectares or 10 by 10 kilometer grids found to have harvest mice than in, in the most recent report, um, reporting per, period compared to the earlier one. We had the survey in 2014. And then in 2018, you can see that there was the latest population review by Fiona Matthews and help from various members of us at the Mammal Society, where we had the latest estimate was 566,000. So what we also found was apart from the occupancy work from the previous slide, there was very little information on the trends. But as you can see, between the 1970s and the 1919 surveys, and between the population reviews, it does generally feels like they're, they're possibly declining. But there's a lot of caveats for this species. You know, the, um, between the population reviews, both estimates were classified as quite self critiqued as low reliability because they were looking at numbers based on ratios of wood mice to harvest mice and there was lots of missing information such as habitat specific occupancy estimates and habitat specific density estimates so it was because of this 
sort of lack of reliability that we decided to at the mammal society to look for producing the next harvest mouse survey this is also incredibly timely as it's seven years since the last survey which is recommended as a period for when to do national surveys by toms i believe and it also was also the 250th anniversary of the scientific naming of this species so uh, next slide please derek uh, this is what led us on to push for the National Harvest Mouse Survey. Now, this was launched almost a year ago, back in October 2021, and ran from October 2021 through to March 2022. Now, the next portion of my presentation now will just be going over a few of the results that we found. So, if we can move on to the next slide. One of the main aims that we wanted to get across in the National Harvest Mass Survey was to promote harvest mass recording. And in this regard, I think the Mammal Society did incredibly well. Um, it, from October through to March, we got 514 surveys. Uh, we got further 389 presences, and this in total recorded 1,448 nests. Uh, now, as I say, I was very happy with this. And if we move on to the next slide, when putting this in context and then the survey's aim to promote recording, when we look at the National Biodiversity Network, which is one of the largest online repositories of biological data in the UK for harvest mice since 1990, you can, well, quite clearly see that 2021 was the most number of records of harvest mice that have entered into the MDN. And even 2022, which so half a survey season is already the second or effectively the third, if you count 2021, numbers of records recorded. So this shows that the survey has achieved one of its first aims of promoting recording of this species. Uh, now, if we move on to the next slide, please. Thank you there, Derek. Spatial coverage of records, uh, again, in my opinion, opinion, was brilliant. We got records from three countries. We've got Scotland, Wales, England. There was no records from Northern Ireland, the Isle of Man or the Channel Isles, but harvest mice are generally not known to be from these areas. Now, when we look at vice county or Watsonian vice counties, these are like um, we can see that over half have information collected as part of this national survey. So we can see that over half of the counties in the UK have been have provided some information on harvest mice. Now, when we start to increase that spatial resolution, when we start looking at hectares, so 10 by 10 kilometer grids, you can see that 9.2% of the UK has been covered. And reducing that right down to tetrads, you can see it's sort of about 0.8%. So we've done a good hit in getting a good spatial coverage of information. Uh, but as you can see, the higher the resolution goes, the less sort of spatial coverage across the UK we have got. But John O'Groats to Land's End, I think we did very well collecting a lot of data in the first initial year. So next slide, please, Derek. iPad centered. Um, one of the other main aims, what I really wanted this survey to do was to create a community of harvest mouse enthusiasts, I guess is probably an all encompassing word. And the, this first initial survey season in 2021 to 2022, has done really well in creating a really strong foundation for a community. We've got 19 coordinators. So these are volunteers from across the country who have taken specific regions or counties and helped myself and us at the Mammal Society to coordinate surveys, record collection, uh, promote the surveys, run training events in their counties. We can't be sure 
how many people were actually involved in the survey because we didn't ask for people's names in the initial survey because of GDPR reasons. But at least to our knowledge, 313 people have got involved in conducting surveys or recording presence only records in the initial survey season. Now, many of the coordinators and, uh, put on a number of training grants across the country. Uh, to our knowledge at the moment, there's 44 training events were conducted in, in the last season, which over 228 people attended. So this national survey's aim to create a community has created a fantastic foundation from which to build on. Now, going on to the next slide, if we could, please. Thank you. One of the main aims from my perspective for this National Harvest Mouse Survey is to develop a monitoring strategy. So back in 2014, uh, when the first, uh, the 2014 survey goes on, went on, there were, the idea was to develop a monitoring strategy. We want to know how harvest mice are doing year on, year out, and what struck me is the majority of records of harvest mice are presence only. I saw this mouse net, or I found this nest at this point at this date, which is brilliant, but it can't tell us where people are looking and not found them. And what we've done to develop a monitoring strategy is effectively promoting surveys over presence only recording. And the way of creating a survey is to promote this recording of survey efforts. So how hard are people looking for nests? And for the purpose of this, the Harvest Mouse survey or the survey effort is just ask, simply asking how many people were looking, could be one, could be 20, and for how long? Five minutes, 20 minutes, two hours. And with this information, we could actually infer non-detections, places on the map where people have looked for harvest mice and not found any, which these non-detections or possible absences are just as important as knowing where the animals are and it's just as important as knowing where they aren't. Also with this information, with non-detections, we can actually count, calculate occupancy. One of that information that was missing from the popu latest population review for habitat specific sites. And, and we're, also, we're also proposing an index of relative abundance. So using just presence only, you know they're there, but we want to be able to see if there's a way of identifying how many animals or how much breeding is going on so that we can make comparison between site A to site B. Scotland to England, these kind of things. So if we can move on to the next slide, please, Derek. And just with this simple addition of survey effort, as I say, we can calculate occupancy. So when we look at occupancy, which is the proportion of sites occupied, so effectively the number of sites with recorded harvest mass presence, where the nests were found, divided by the total number of sites surveyed, we can identify what proportion of sites are occupied by harvest mice. When we look at all the survey collect data collected from the first year, <coughs> sorry, well, from the first year of um, the initial survey season, we can see that just under half of all sites surveyed had harvest mice. Now this is irrespective of habitat or time of year. So it's quite a crude estimate. Half of the sites people looked in, we can see that they found a harvest mice nest. Now to try and develop a, an index of abundance, I've used this MPHSE or the number nests per hour of survey effort. So when we look at the number of nests found, uh, at a site visit divided by the number of people that were looking times by how long they're looking. So if you found 
10 nests, uh, let's say 100 nests, let's do some easy calculations here. If you had found 100 nests on a site and it was 10 people looking for 10 minutes, you would get roughly one nest found every minute. What we found from the first season of the Harvest Mouse survey was irrespective of habitat, position, uh, everything like that, the average number of nests per hour of survey effort was 2.31. So that means that if anyone went out surveying, on average, if you looked for an hour, you're irrespective of um, habitat or anything like that, you're likely to find 2.3 nests per hour of looking. Uh, this equates to finding one nest every 26 minutes or something like that. So this is just a way to try and create an index of relative abundance so we can sort of compare things and I'll move on and talk about a little bit about this later on. Uh, so Derek, if we can move on. So one of the advantages of looking at present uh, having non-detections is that we can see here using uh, Bedfordshire as an example, we can actually, instead of just putting where harvest mice were found, we can actually identify grid squares where they weren't. And also how many times, so if you look in this little cutout here, you'll see one grid square has been shown to be present from one record. But then further up in this left hand side on one end, you can see a grid square, 10 by 10 kilometer grid square was shown to be present by multiple records from different areas. And then you can also see uh, that a grid is actually a non detection because you've looked at several spots within that grid and not found them. So, yep, next slide, please, Derek. Um, so to have a look and see if we can bring this information, as I say, the information of to habitat specific occupancy estimates and density estimates were two of the things lacking for this species with the last population review. So what we've done with all the survey data with information on how many people were looking and how many nests were found and how long they looked for, we looked at calculating the habitat specific occupancy estimates. So you can see that when you go to wet grasslands, you can see that nine out of 10 of them are occupied. So you go to tame wet grasslands, chances are you should have a good chance of finding a harvest mice there. When, if you go down to others, you can see gardens is 50-50, but that's only from two surveys. Uh, but then you look at field margins, roughly half of field margins are occupied. But then when you look at the nest per hour of survey effort, you can see you find a lot more nests in field margins than um, in wet grassland, for instance. So you're more likely to find them in wet grassland, but you find more nests in field margins. And this comes on to one of the other aims. Next slide quickly, Derek. Thank you. Comes on to one of our main areas, which was to um, promote harvest mice as an indicator species. So Bents uh, has already suggested that harvest mice are a good indicator of arable landscape. Now, being able to divide the surveys into habitats like field margins, we can see that the number of nests in field margins is quite high and the occupancy. So we can look at this potentially over time if we continue surveys year in, year out to see how these values change. And this is all information that can be used to help identify the number of animals and where they are. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So the main aim of the National Harvest Mouse Survey was to identify what their current status is, how many are there, what's their distribution, and how that distribution is changing over time. Now, basically, the answer is one year's 
worth of data from the initial survey is not enough to really satisfactorily judge the status. Uh, we can see we did incredibly well in the first year with 20% of these historic reference. Uh, so I'll take a step back. So the way of judging an assessment is by looking at a historical reference point. So using the British Atlas of Mammals, we can use that to know where they were previously. And using the data from the first initial harvest mouse survey, we can see how many of these hectares have been reconfirmed as being present with harvest mice. <clears throat> and what we can see from Herefordshire as the cutout example, you can see, as Derek said, in the greens and dark greens is the recent period uh, from 2000 to 2016. We've confirmed probably 112. Yeah, 112 of these have been reconfirmed this year. That's roughly about um, even historic sites from night where records haven't been recorded of harvest mice since 1992. You look in the small cutout in the bottom left you can see that these historic records where they haven't been recorded for 30 years have since been shown to still be there and present there. But what is even better is we can actually see in areas where we don't actually have much information, we can't tell whether they weren't there or whether no one has looked there, we can actually see now that there's also extra information like we can say that we've surveyed there and haven't seen them, but we can also identify areas previously unknown with confirmed presences. To judge this distributional assessment, you want to see how many of these previous sites have been reconfirmed. And we reconfirmed 20% of them in the first year. However, the problem is we only managed to survey 27% of the previous distribution. Uh, however, we have gone beyond that distribution and found some more presences. So at this moment, we would still, I would still probably say that our status of sediment is still data efficient and we need more data, which brings us on to the next and final slide, I believe. Nope, second to final slide brings us on to this year's, this next season of the National Harvest Mouse Survey. We, we need to collect more data from more geographical regions and um, we will effectively kick starting it again today where we'll be launching very shortly basically for all your harvest national harvest mass survey information head to the national harvest mass survey web page by clicking on the link that you can see at the bottom of the screen and this will give you all your information and I'll be happy to answer any questions about the survey, such as where should we survey? Uh, how do you survey? How do you record the data? Where do I submit the data? Is there a coordinator in my area? These kind of things I'll be happy to answer shortly. But what I can say if we move on to the next and final slide now, this year has already started off really well. I personally over summer have been talking to lots and lots of people across the country to try and get the, a, a bigger geographical area by getting volunteer coordinators to confirm in new areas that they're willing to help the Mammal Society coordinate their area for this upcoming survey. So we've gone from 19, a good foundation during the initial year, already up to 27 confirmed coordinators. Many of them have been given months of lead in time. They know that this is happening. Many of them are members of mammal groups and already, already organizing training events. I did my first training event a couple of days ago. I know I've seen harvest mice nests starting to come in. And I know there's a couple more events coming up very soon. I think you've got one on the second, Derek. There's one on the eighth and one on the ninth I know of off the top of my head. So yeah, the 22nd and the 30th. Yeah. So this this season is already already started. And I'm really excited. 
and basically go to the web page if you want to know any information if you want to send us any information about records or harvest mice, as Derek says, if you just come across when the registration starts dying back, or if you have any general queries about the survey, uh, please just email us at surveys at the Mammal Society and one of the team will get back to you. Uh, if you don't see, if you belong to one of the areas that's not covered in this map in, on the right in front of you, and you, you'd be interested in coordinating or want to know more about it, please email me directly at science at the Mammal Society. But that's pretty much the end of the survey. If you've got questions, please feel free to answer them now. And I hope to look forward to seeing all your survey data come through in the future. Thank you for listening. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Derek and Fraser. Um, I really enjoyed that talk and it was great to learn um, more about the ecology of the harvest mouse as well as how you can get involved in our current survey. So I have had no questions through on the chat so far. Oh, I've had one. Okay, this is perfect. So um, if anyone needs to pop out for a second, then this is the perfect time to do it. But if not, we will crack on with the Q and A. Yeah, so we, we, if you're going to, we, we, we want you to record as many harvest mice as possible, and also other mammals as well. And therefore, um, this is the one of the methods um, to use, which is our phone app called Mammal Mapper. If you're not aware of it, we'd like you to download it. It will allow you to actually do a survey. And if you don't find any harvest mice, it still sends us the data. Um, so it's a very useful thing. You don't have to start looking up maps. And there is a link just um, put in the chat to uh, to give you a link to that uh, that resource. Yes. So um, as Derek was saying, you can record harvest mouse nests as easily as from your own smartphone. And we have our free app to do that on. And that link has just been popped in the chat. Um, but I have got a question from Rebecca for both of you. Um, how active is the research in Nottinghamshire? Um, Rebecca, do you mean like harvest mouse nest searches or, well, we'll go with that one for the moment. Do you guys know what it's like in Nottinghamshire? Uh, yes. So if you, if you look on the harvest mouse uh, web page we have a list of coordinators and we've had a coordinator in Nottingham in the first year and also confirmed for this year. Um, in the first year of the survey there wasn't much interest come through but this year we've had uh, members of the university already contact the mammal group so it's going to be more active this year than it was last year so check on the web page and get in touch with the coordinator at Nottingham. I know she'll love to hear from you. Brilliant, thank you, Fraser. Um, our next question for both of you is from Carol, who says, any indications of changes in distribution as a result of climate change that we've found so far? I think it's a very difficult one to, to answer that one. Um, because we're finding mice, um, in new places that and that's partly because people haven't looked it's very hard to actually uh, attribute that to climate change or anything else but one of our, our big excitements from last year was that we found more nests in Scotland where the uh, harvest mice traditionally have been assumed to be uh, not present and yet we've managed to find mice uh, all the way on the north coast as well as um, further south so basically all four corners all four sides of Scotland have got harvest mice there's just large gaps in between where we haven't got those records or people haven't looked. Fabulous and it'll be interesting as well to see if there has been any effects of the drought this year on nests etc too but we'll find that out next year when we look at the results. Um, our next question 
is actually, sorry, Mel has popped in the chat as well, the name of the Nottingham coordinator, Emma Parkin. So that's for you. Um, our next question is from Emma, who asks, will our local coordinator send out priority areas for nest searches? Um, they're located in Devon. So your the coordinator for Devon will be Sarah. Uh, what I've been doing with many of the confirmed coordinators over summer is having uh, having a look with the, at them with them <clears throat> of the first year survey and the historical data to start identifying areas which should be surveyed. So Sarah should will have an idea of the sort of priority areas from sort of help increase our geographical knowledge to complete fill up more of the squares uh so yes but if not uh feel free to get in touch with me and i'll happily <laughs> direct fabulous thank you fraser and um, our next question is from Farhat, who asks are nests made of fresh green grass an indication they are potentially active, particularly during the breeding period? Yes, it's a simple answer to that one. Um, they they use actively growing um, leaves and stems and, and, and they can incorporate them in. They can be very hard to find because it's green on green, but yes, they are active nests. It's mm. we, we make the assumption that if we search in um, October, then the breeding season is at an end. Um, although if the weather is still mild, you still might have late litters there. But the chance of disturbances is, is greatly reduced and there's not an issue. I was out um, weekend before last and we found a green nest with droppings on it. Um, and so we, we, we left that area fairly pronto, uh, so we didn't cause too much disturbance. Um, but it was a good, good sign to find, uh, very hard to find, um, because of the green on green. Fantastic. And yeah, as Derek has said, this is why we are running it from October onwards, as it does reduce the risk. But you never know. Um, Ines asks... If we do a harvest mouse survey and record the results in on Mammal Mapper, but we don't find any harvest mouse evidence, how can we state that we are specifically looking for a harvest mouse nest? Like, how can you get that through Mammal Mapper? Is there so, a uh, Derek showed you um, the initial screenshot of the mm -hmm. Mammal Mapper app. And uh, when you click start a survey, on the first screen, it will up. Have you? Are you showing your screen up? I'm now? trying to show, try my 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 phone. <laughs> Whether you can see that, that don't think it will show the detail. No, it doesn't. But <laughs> well, there will be an option to record a survey ID, and if you click on that, a drop down mess a uh, drop down menu will appear, and on that, one of the options will be harvest mouse. When okay. you start that survey, it will record the time you start looking, where mm -hmm. you move, and when you click finish, the time you stop stopping. So it will tell us how long you're looking for. However, mm -hmm. we need to do an update to include the number of people, but in the location, if you write one person, then we have all the information we need to record a survey. And then if you don't record any harvest mice, we know that you've looked, how long you've looked and how many people. So it will give us the option of a norm detection. Thank you, Fraser. And um, I will write that up with you in a week's time and I will distribute that to everyone as well, just in case they need to know. Um, and Roland's just commented as well with the Mammal Mapper app he's experiencing on Samsung some geolocation issues. But I assume that in the update, like that will be being looked at as well. Okay, uh, I think there has been a general all-round smartphone update to the Android system. Mm -hmm. uh, this happened on my phone as well, and it is actually quite a simple fix. So if you just go into your phone settings and turn off 
battery optimization or something could put app to sleep when not in use and take mammal mapper off that list because for instance when i do a survey i click start a survey put the harvest mouse the number of people and where, what habitat i'm looking and then i throw it in my bag and this recent phone update means that it stops recording so if you just check in your settings it should fix that issue okay brilliant thank you for that, and also if, if people are having difficulty with that spatial things then there are other methods of recording for ad hoc surveys anyway you can go either via our web page on recording which will take mm -hmm. you to an iRecord page or you can download the iRecord app um, and we um, get those records um, through our verification process or the verification process. Yes, Derek's made a very good point and I've just put the link in the chat for anyone who needs to see that too. Um, our next question is from Peter, who asks, how will a coordinator know which are priority sites? And um, that's Peter Pilbeam. I can't remember if you're one of our coordinators, yeah. Peter. So you're working with Alison from Cambridge, am I right? Yes. Sorry, uh, yeah, as I say, going from 19 up to 27. But um, so I've spoken to a lot of the coordinators on one-to-one -one phone calls and Zoom links. And I'm afraid to say it's a question that is, how long is a piece of string? So priority sites in, say, Scotland, a huge area of very few records is going to be different to say a county where in the first year of survey they collected a lot of records from across the country. To keep my answer short and sweet, and this is the best a description as I can describe, I think this is the easiest and best way of describing it, is to say the next year is to try and get equal numbers of hectares. This is myself and from a national perspective, equal numbers of surveys done in hectares with previous recorded presences from last year's survey, hectares with non-detections and hectares with no information. So equal numbers of previous, so we get repeats to see that they're still there. Could be training sites, you've got better chance of to areas where they haven't been seen last year to try and have another look in another area or the same area to see if we can identify an areas where we haven't had records. I think that's the easiest way of describing it and that will cover as many different scenarios. Uh, and the important see, thing is that, sorry Fraser, and the important thing is that you send out those maps that you saw on the, on the talk tonight, which shows you which squares in your county have been looked at historically. So you can work, so the coordinators can work out where they want people to go. So I think nearly 90%, 95% of the coordinators should have those maps for their counties. So they can, effectively they can make their own decision of where they think is priority. What's important for your county is up. Well, thank you very much for that, Fraser. Um, and Peter, if you haven't heard still, then you can chase up your coordinator and uh, say that you heard it here first. So our next question is from Giles, who asks, are there any license requirements surrounding harvest mouse surveys? Also, any specific mitigation for harvest mice due to large scale destruction of habitat? Although they are a bat species, there isn't any license requirements. There's no um, specific laws um, protecting them. There is just uh, a consideration should be made from planning applications um, about their habitats. And one of the things that last year survey results are going to help us with is to try and work out um, what management actually comes in from some of the historical sites that I've been working on for the last 20 odd years, um, you can have some quite severe um, grass cutting and the animals merely disappear to the edges and then come back and reinvade the, those areas mm -hmm. later on. But we would encourage any grass cutting to happen um, 
much more towards the autumn period, although the, we might lose the nest for surveys, the animals by that stage will basically be uh, much more on the ground than actually up in the vegetation. Brilliant. No, thank you for that answer, Derek. Um, and at the moment, there are no other questions on the chat. If anyone does have any other questions, then speak now or forever hold your peace. While I just say a huge thank you to Derek and Fraser for giving this webinar, it has been so insightful and I hope that it's helped some of the queries that people have had surrounding our Harvest Mouse survey, which possibly may have been stopping you joining in, but hopefully not. And now you have no excuse but to join in. So on that thought, as we mentioned earlier, you can find out all of the information that you need about how to get involved, who your local coordinator might be, how to survey, where to look, etc. all on our website. So please go there as your first port of call as it has a ton of information on it and it's great. So um, I will be emailing you that web link um, tomorrow with a link to this recording so you can watch it again and recap on anything that you have missed out. So don't worry about that. Additionally, we'll be doing a press release which goes out tomorrow about the first season's uh, results. So you have had a quick sneak peek at that tonight, which you will be able to read all about tomorrow. So don't forget to look up that. And as well, we will be relaunching our appeal from tomorrow um, as we are a charity and we do need your help in order to do our work. So we would be very appreciative if you could have a look at that too. But without further ado, I will let everyone have their Wednesday evening back from us and say thank you all for turning up. Um, that's been great. And thank you again to Fraser and Derek. And we will hopefully see all of you guys on a Harvest Mouse survey soon. Brilliant. Brilliant. See you guys later.